If I ask you to think of a dangerous animal, what do you think of? Maybe something venomous, maybe something that can spread disease, or maybe a large predator, or maybe you'll be clever and say human. And there is a case for all of that, but less often I imagine people say a large herbivore. And it seems like we can see that ambivalence being displayed in real time. Grizzlies, black bears, wolves, and mountain lions live in Yellowstone, but it's the bison that cause the most human injuries. Now, it's not that bison are particularly out looking to hurt a human, but the fact that they can be found relatively easily and that some people think getting close to them to take photos or even touching them is a good idea, well, it leads to incidents and it's not recommended. Other herbivores can be even more aggressive and territorial. There has been a bit of a debate through the continent of Africa as to whether or not Nile crocodiles or hippos cause more human fatalities. As far as I'm aware, we only have estimates, but the fact that there is even a debate just shows how dangerous a big angry herbivore can be. So what if we went even bigger than a hippo? Asian elephants aren't as large as their African counterparts, but exceptionally large bulls can be somewhere close to 3.43 meters or 11.3 feet tall at the shoulder and weigh close to 7 tons, almost 7,000 kilos, and perhaps they can get even larger. Now, maybe someone might think, well, just being large doesn't mean it's dangerous. A tiger might not be as big, but they eat meat and your meat, as people in the comments like to tell me. While I don't want to overstate the danger or vilify any animal, it is true that people are killed by tigers every year in India. If we look at government statistics from India from 2014 to 2022, we see that on average about 50 people a year are killed by tigers. However, an average of about 500 people a year are killed by elephants in India. But if not to eat, why do so many people get killed by elephants? It's an ongoing issue. Some of it may have to do with farmers trying to scare away elephants eating their crops. And, according to Kirthi Karanth, a conservationist for the Wild Elements Foundation, a lot of deaths were, quote, where people happen to be walking home at night and they just run into elephants. Elephants will generally avoid humans if they can, but what if one didn't? What if a large bull decided he didn't like humans so much and chose to express that anger towards people? What happens when a highly intelligent, large animal goes on a killing spree in rural India? Well, unfortunately for the people involved, that did happen. And this is the story. In the heart of central India, during the mid-1800s, a small village in the jungle of the Mandala district was still during a cool January night. The surrounding jungle was filled with shadows, and one particularly large shadow was moving towards the village, and the ground began to tremble as the colossus drew closer. Those who were lucky and noticed the elephant's approach fled to the rooftops of their houses, those who were less lucky tried to escape the village, including a woman and her child, who tried to flee, but in their dash for the trees, the large bull took notice and charged them down, killing them both. On another night near the end of January, the elephant killed another woman in a different village further west, reportedly tearing her limb from limb. These nightly attacks continued into February, again and again, going from village to village and on the 1st of February, he killed a man and a woman. A few nights later, the bull approached another village, where the inhabitants again tried to flee from the rampaging animal, and while some were able to escape, others weren't. Two elderly women were unable to outpace the rampaging animal, and were both killed, ripped apart again. And not only that, but according to the villagers, 
The elephant even devoured one of the women. As the month went on, the killing continued. The elephant mostly killed women and children, on one occasion even ripping a baby away from its mother's arms with its trunk. Multiple other reports of the giant devouring a man and another old woman also emerged. One might think this must be some kind of a mistake from the witnesses, gripped by chaos and fear, and perhaps it is an exaggeration or a misinterpretation. But looking into it, there have been some more recent accounts of this happening. A rogue elephant that had killed 17 people in India back in 2011 was killed and DNA testing on the contents of its stomach suggested it had consumed human flesh. Regardless of how truthful the man-eating claims were, the elephant was causing a lot of death and destruction. On some nights, when it entered a village, it did not kill anyone, possibly due to all the villagers escaping on time, but the animal would then tear down and destroy multiple homes. One night, the elephant passed a police station on its way to terrorize another village, and multiple police officers, close to a dozen, pursued the animal and even took shots at it. But their weapons were no match for the elephant's tough hide, and it disappeared into the surrounding jungle. In the thick brush of the surrounding hills, even an animal that large can disappear. Attempts were made to pursue the big bull, but given the difficult task ahead, the constable requested some assistance. It seems once an animal becomes infamous for attacking and killing humans, man-eater or otherwise, its fate is sealed in the same way. The main source we have for these accounts comes from Colonel A. Bloomfield. He wrote about the encounters at the time, and then much later his story was printed in three separate parts in Hornbill magazine in the 1980s. We also have an account from the 1893 book Wild Beasts by J. Hamden Porter. But let's return to Bloomfield since his account is a first-hand account of what happened, and it is also an account of how he stopped it. He arrived in the district in mid-February, and tracking the signs of the elephant, realized it had probably taken refuge in the surrounding hills that were covered in quote, thick jungle. The attacks had seemed to peter out, and they thought the animal had probably been wounded. Gathering information on the animal, Bloomfield heard how the bull was big even for an elephant, and had tusks close to three or four feet long, about 1.2 meters. It also seemed that this angry bull was in a state of must. Must, or must, is a term that comes from Persian meaning intoxicated. It occurs in male elephants during mating season when the testosterone levels shoot up and the male becomes much more aggressive and unpredictable. Be it in the wild or a captive elephant, a bull in must is a dangerous beast. There was even a case in the 90s where male elephants or bulls in must started attacking and killing endangered rhinos, seemingly unprovoked, though there is more to that story. Regardless, this elephant had actually been seen around for a number of years. In 1868, it was occasionally spotted on the edge of villages, but without issue. There were other reports of the elephant even being spotted in 1871, but during the first seven months of the hot and rainy seasons, the elephant did not disturb anyone. However, as the months started to grow colder again, it seems the male entered a period of must, and that is when the attacks started to happen in mass. Bloomfield could not spend much time in the district and had to return to his post. And then for the rest of the year, it seemed the elephant wasn't interested in bothering people anymore and it faded away into the jungles. But almost a year later, he was sitting in a courtroom in early November when a man named F.A. Naylor entered. Naylor was the district superintendent of police and he came with terrible news. The elephant, which Naylor described as a man-eating elephant, was back, and he had killed another man. There was no time to wait, and the men began packing that night, each loading up on a variety of powerful rifles. They set out the next morning, but Naylor 
being a police officer, had to go out of his way further north to a place called Moa, but told Bloomfield he'd join him in Bahar as soon as he possibly could. The colonel took his horse with him, a former racehorse named Mozart. This horse wasn't just fast, he was also known for keeping his cool and not losing his nerve, even when his rider was firing rounds off from on top of him, a skill that might come in useful. Bloomfield took a direct route to Bahar, through the high hills on a trail known as the Windy Pass. The colonel had befriended many of the local tribes in the jungle, and as he made camp along the way, they would come and visit and speak to him. As he moved through a cliff pass and got closer to his destination, he realized he was going to need as much help as possible, especially for tracking, and sent word to a small village that he needed help. And being friendly with the locals, people agreed to join him. A few days later, in early November, he reached Jakar, a small village eight miles south of Bahir, and found the superintendent of the Mandala district, a Mr. Hanklin, and he was also in pursuit of the killer elephant. He had so far been unsuccessful, and he told the colonel that the harder he tried to pursue the animal, the more it evaded him. Bloomfield was hoping Hanklin would be able to join him, and then they could continue the pursuit of the elephant together. But unfortunately, Hanklin also had duties to tend to, and had to leave the next day and return to his district. Bloomfield went about trying to gather as much information as possible about the killer, and discovered that the animal had been seen in late October, in a hamlet close to the Mandala border. Many settlements, including this small hamlet, plant crops in the summer, and then by October they are close to harvest. Growing crops in the jungle can be a challenging task due to all the wild animals. To protect the fields, people erect platforms about 10 to 12 feet high, about 3 to 3.6 meters, to watch over their fields. These platforms are called a machan. They could probably scare away the deer and wild pigs from the ground, but sometimes those deer and pigs are followed by large predators like tigers, panthers, and bears. I would have thought that it would be fairly limited protection against the cats. The colonel even noted that sometimes it wasn't particularly good in the case of the man-eating panther of Asola, the large cat would climb up and drag the occupant away into the night. Though I suppose if the option is to have a platform or not, I guess I'd choose the Machan. The people did of course try to tackle the issue of predators by having two people in the platform, so that at least while one person was able to sleep, another could keep watch. They would also sometimes keep a fire burning near the bottom of the platform. Anyway, in October, a father and son team were in such a platform, keeping watch over the fields. One night, while the father slept, the son heard something approaching. Footsteps of something large moving through the jungle. They were about to have a visit from an animal significantly larger than any other creature that had been in the fields. And as this creature got nearer, the son realized it was an elephant. And he also realized that since no wild or domestic elephant lived within 50 miles of this small village, the approaching giant had to be the killer elephant of Mandala. The boy woke his father, and the two of them rushed off the platform and towards the village. The boy, who was younger and faster, made it in time. His father, however, was not as fast, and the elephant caught up to him and crushed him to death. Later in October, on the 29th, a husband and wife were in a similar machan close to the village of Jata, keeping watch over their local rice fields. The wife was awake keeping watch, gripped by fear after hearing the stories of the mad elephant attacking villages in the area. As she gazed out into the darkness, she heard the dreaded sound of heavy footsteps as the massive animal came towards the fields. She immediately woke her husband and started to escape towards the village, but had to stop when she remembered there was another machan in the nearby fields with two boys who were also keeping watch. She sprinted towards them yelling out that the elephant was coming and the boys climbed down and rushed to the village, as did the woman. Her husband, however, 
did not believe her at first, and by the time the elephant arrived, it was too late. He tried to escape, but the bull caught him, ripping him apart and throwing his limbs into the fields. But the bull wasn't finished. He circled the area and came to another group of watchers who fled at the sight of the huge animal approaching. But some, who were older, could not move as fast as the others, and one old man fell behind as the big bull approached. He ran as fast as he possibly could, but he could hear the giant getting closer and closer as it crashed through the rice fields. The man stumbled and turning fell onto his back. The bull approached and rammed its two tusks into the ground on either side of the man, trapping him in the middle. The old man thought he was surely doomed and placed a hand on each tusk and prayed to Ganesh and the elephant moved away and left the man unharmed. This old man lived on to tell Bloomfield his story. The colonel, however, was skeptical of the account, but after questioning the man many times, he seemed to believe the story of him placing his hands on the tusks and thought that maybe it really was true. He also learned that after the elephant left the old man, it continued on with a spree of destruction. The watchers fled to the village for safety, but the security they sought couldn't really be provided by the bamboo houses with thatched roofs. The buildings were probably fine as general purpose homes, but not so good for protecting against an angry rampaging elephant who tore down multiple houses, sometimes to get the grain inside, sometimes just because he could. Some fled to the house of the local Pujari, or holy man. He gave them refuge, and as the bull approached, he stood in the doorway and prayed to Ganesh to protect his home and to protect the people inside. However, this time the prayer did not seem to have any effect on the angry male who started ripping the house apart. The Pujari took the people and fled to another nearby village. They returned a few days later and recounted the events of Bloomfield on the morning of November 3rd. The burning question Bloomfield had for the survivors was, where was the elephant now? But no one was sure. As the colonel wrote, the villages were surrounded on all sides by hills a thousand feet above sea level and covered in thick jungles with little to no paths or trails. Mr. Hanklin had sent scouts out hoping to find some sign of the animal, but so far, they had not returned, and the only clue Bloomfield had was that the elephant had been seen going south. Not a whole lot to go on, and the colonel often wrote the phrase, finding a needle in a haystack, when trying to figure out a way to track down this large animal. It was lucky then that he had asked for help from his local friends in Kandahar. He gave them some provisions and sent them south told them to extend a little further east and west as they went, with the instruction to send word back immediately if they found the animal or any trail of it. He was too afraid to make a move in any direction yet, in case he went in the wrong direction and lost valuable time. He did not have to wait long though, as later that day word came back the elephant had indeed continued south and had passed through two other villages, killing two men in one of them. The next morning at the break of dawn, Bloomfield mounted his horse and with his guides, he headed south in pursuit of the animal. Due to the vegetation and the time of year, it wasn't long until the colonel was drenched in moisture from the jungle. Even on top of Mozart, he couldn't escape the dampness, and his guides on foot were even more soaked. After some time, they found the tracks of the elephant, and when the footprints were clear, they measured them, and from that, they estimated the large male to be somewhere between eight to nine cubits tall at the shoulder, which is 12 to 13 and a half feet tall, 3.6 to 4 meters. That's very tall for an Asian elephant and would make this bull a record breaker, but it is an estimate height based on footprints. Whether or not the bull was really that tall is hard to say, but considering the locals said its shoulder reached the top of their houses, it is clear he was exceptionally large. They continued the pursuit going through the jungle and following the elephant's trail that seemingly veered away from any human settlement, at least for a while, until they followed the trail up a steep hill about 2,700 feet above sea level and came to a clearing, the small village of Jagla. 
The elephant had been there a few nights before. Again, in the middle of the night it came. Entering the clearing, there were no sounds of people screaming and rushing away as the elephant approached. The village was silent, apart from the footsteps of the approaching giant. The huge male approached a house and pulled off a piece of the thatched roof, but there was no one inside. The elephant went to the next house, and again, no one was there. The villagers hadn't left the village though, but when they heard the elephant approach, they retreated to the house of the Punjari, and now, huddling together, they quietly watched through the cracks in the walls as the elephant searched the village, going from house to house. The villagers watched and waited, hoping the elephant would get bored and march back into the jungle. After some time, it did seem like the elephant had grown tired and was starting to leave, but then it stopped. It turned around and moved towards the Pujari's house. The occupants froze as the elephant approached. It lifted the roof off of the house and the people inside did probably the best thing they could. They froze and held their breath as a large trunk slithered in to search the home. Under the cover of darkness and the silence, the elephant decided there was nothing of interest for him there and wandered back into the jungle. As Bloomfield interviewed the villagers, it was clear that they were still in great fear. It seemed the elephant was still heading south. Bloomfield sat down with some of the locals, called the Baigas, and looked at the elephant's root, referred to as the Baiga people. If the animal continued to head south, it would end up leaving the jungle hills and would come out onto open plains. Since the elephant was using the jungle to appear and disappear as it liked, Bloomfield was confident that once the large male reached the open environment, he'd turn around and head back north again into the hills. If true, then the elephant should end up turning around and heading straight into the path of Bloomfield and his party heading south in pursuit. But he had to make sure the elephant didn't get past. The colonel sent two smaller parties further out, one further east and the other further west, and told them to fan out in a long line and then head south. That way, the three groups would hopefully make a net, and hopefully, if the elephant did turn around and head back north, it would not be able to slip past. They continued on the trail of the killer, moving not only through vegetation, but also rough granite and rock through huge boulders that made the way difficult to pass through puzzling Bloomfield on how the elephant made it through. The huge creature was causing more carnage as it went, destroying more buildings and killing more people. When the elephant finally did reach the tall grass of the open plains, it did not turn around, but in fact continued south. A group of men carrying a vessel of grain through the long grass saw the giant coming towards them. They dropped the vessel and spread out into the tall grass, diving down and hiding as best as they could. The elephant searched for the men, but when it was unable to find them, it turned to the vessel, eating a little of the grain before smashing the container and scattering the rest into the grass. The elephant may have moved out of the jungle hills, and while the plains may have had less cover, there were still bamboo forests and areas of thick brush that the elephant could use to be less conspicuous. These areas also had villages though. As word spread of the elephant, people were beginning to adapt to protect themselves from this killer. People started making more machans or watchtowers, and as soon as darkness came, they would climb up them and stay there until daybreak. How effective these towers were is kind of up for question. Considering they were constructed out of mostly bamboo and the elephant had smashed through entire homes with bamboo walls, it doesn't seem like they would have been strong enough if the elephant wanted to break them. Some villages managed to remain unscathed, but that was more because the elephant didn't come near the village overall. In fact, we have pretty good evidence they weren't the best for protection, as the elephant destroyed and knocked people out of watchtowers in nearby villages before trampling and killing the inhabitants. The elephant was continuing to kill, but somehow was becoming more difficult to track as it was no longer moving straight south, but instead, almost as if trying to evade the pursuers, was changing directions, and instead of continuing on its original path, 
turned and went east towards the Dio River under more hills of brush. It might seem that the elephant was moving away from the small villages to rest and bathe in the waters of the Dio River, but unfortunately that wasn't what happened. Eight men were sleeping on the sandy bank of the river after spending the day collecting bamboo. The youngest of the group, a boy really, woke up when he heard the animal approaching. Still groggy from sleep, he blinked his eyes open and glimpsed a large shape drawing near. At first, he mistook it for a massive tiger, but as the figure drew closer and his vision cleared, he realized it wasn't a tiger at all, but an elephant. He alerted the other men, but by the time they were all awake, the elephant was nearly on top of them. They ran down the bank as the bull chased them towards a thicket of brush, and they leapt in and were out of reach of the elephant. Or at least, most of them were. One man took longer to wake up, but in the chaos, he was able to escape down the river in the opposite direction and hid in a bush. But the elephant wasn't satisfied. It doubled back and somehow knew where this man was and ripped him out of the bush with his long trunk. He slammed him onto the ground over and over until he was dead. The next day, Bloomfield found the man's remains as well as the footprints of the elephant, doubling back to find the man. Things were bad, but they were about to get worse. Bloomfield sent his scouts out to try and find any sign of the elephant, and he even took Mozart out to ride around and collect information on the whereabouts of the animal. The more time the elephant went on, the more people died, and in one weekend in November, the elephant killed 10 people and injured two others. The killing spree was driving the colonel crazy, and he was disgusted at the carnage he had failed to stop writing, a piece of butchery that has never before been anywhere approached by any man-eating tiger or any other brute. A record that is not likely to be surpassed or even equaled. There are other individual animals with an overall higher kill count, but I can't think of any individual that had such a high kill count in such a short period of time. Of course, Bloomfield wasn't the only one who wanted the elephant dead. And when the elephant was sighted near the Dio River on multiple occasions, a group of local men near where the elephant had last been seen decided they had had enough and arranged to head out to the river on their way to the local market or bazaar. Armed with guns and swords, the eight men went to the river at around 3 p.m. They approached the bank over a deep part, but the elephant was gone, or so they thought. There was a sound from behind the men, not footsteps, but yelling. One of their friends who had arrived late was sprinting towards them and screaming, run, run, the elephant is coming. And with a crash, the large bull burst through the trees and charged the men. With the massive bull only a few yards away and closing fast, they didn't risk trying to pierce its hide with their guns or swords and jumped into the deep flowing river, grabbing onto long pieces of grass and reeds to stop them being dragged away by the current. But the elephant reached out its trunk to grab any of the men that it could, and when it got close to a man named Faisu, the man let go and swam down the river, but the elephant wasn't going to let him get away. And as Faizu swam, the elephant ran along the bank of the river beside him. Faizu swam to the opposite side of the river, but the elephant was hungry for blood and wasn't going to give up. Instead, it rushed into the river and charged to the other side. Faizu climbed up the nearest tree, rising as fast as he could through the branches, when the elephant burst out of the water and rammed into it. It lifted its trunk and nearly grabbed Faizu, but he was just out of reach. In a fit of rage, the elephant continued to ram the tree and ripped branches off. Faizu clung on for dear life, but the elephant didn't leave until nightfall. And then, he finally climbed down and returned to his village. The next day, he met Bloomfield and told him the story. The colonel was frustrated that again he had missed the brute, but he did learn some valuable information. Bloomfield had assumed that the elephant didn't attack during daylight, and that perhaps the animal's temperament was less aggressive during the day. He now knew that was false. He also learned something maybe even more important. This animal, which he described as a beast, was awake during the night and late afternoon. Beast or not, the bull had to sleep at some point, and the colonel figured early morning was probably when the animal slept, and therefore 
probably a good time for a potential counterattack. There was also some other good news. Naylor, the superintendent from earlier, had finished his official duties and arrived along with his big guns. I should also mention that Bloomfield had also brought his own elephant with him, a smaller, tame, female elephant. When exactly he got the elephant, I'm not sure. Perhaps he had her since the beginning of the endeavor, or perhaps one of the locals brought the elephant. But either way, he didn't really mention her until towards the end of his writings, so who knows. Having the female elephant was advantageous not only because she could carry supplies, but also could potentially distract the male, giving the men an extra chance to deal with the raging bull. Bloomfield had a renewed sense of confidence now that Naylor had caught up with him and it was time to continue the pursuit. The elephant was seen skirting villages and tearing down watchtowers in his wake. He had moved a little further north again and was closer to the jungles. After days of tracking him, they eventually had a sighting. Moving through the rice fields, they saw a huge shadow in the distance, moving along the tree line near the horizon. Even from a distance, they were taken aback by the sheer size of this animal as he lumbered into the trees and out of sight. Bloomfield had a burning desire to pursue, but it was about to get dark and the elephant was too far ahead. But they were closer to stopping the animal now. Having to wait for daylight, they returned to a nearby village to make camp. A few tents were set up and watchmen stationed in the surrounding trees. By 9pm, Bloomfield was trying to fall asleep, but there was a lot of nervous chatter around the camp. They knew the large bull was out there somewhere, in the dark. And they also knew he liked to attack at night. As the night went on though, the men finally fell asleep. As you might expect though, a loud noise woke the colonel up at around 2 a.m. One of the watchmen was yelling that he could hear something in the distance. Not footsteps, but rather destruction. The bull was destroying something somewhere. They went out to try and find the giant, but the distant crashing subsided and it was hard to find even a giant in the darkness. They returned to camp and by the time they did, the sun was starting to rise on the horizon with a dark shape in front of the orange glow. Moving towards them, an elephant was coming. Bloomfield and Naylor raised their rifles up. The huge creature was coming closer and closer. As it approached, Bloomfield wondered if it was coming for them or for the female elephant that was... Wait, where was the female? The colonel darted his head back and forth. She had been tied up by the camp the night before, but now was nowhere to be seen. He yelled out to the watchmen, asking where the female was, but they didn't know. During the night's commotion, she had been untied and let loose. Naylor still had his rifle raised. Bloomfield placed a hand on his shoulder. Wait, don't shoot, he said. The big approaching animal was silhouetted by the rising sun, and he couldn't make out any detail. It got closer and closer, and it's not him, he thought. Still unable to see the animal fully, Bloomfield knew it was the female, just by the calm and relaxed manner that she approached. He was right, and the female elephant wandered back into the camp. It was now early morning, and if Bloomfield's theory was correct, the big bull should be sleeping somewhere nearby. This could be the golden opportunity he was waiting for. Just as the elephant had gotten the jump on people as they slept through the night, perhaps they had a chance to get up close to the elephant while he slept during the early morning. They gathered the guides and got ready to pursue. If the elephant was really asleep, it was imperative that they didn't accidentally wake him before they had the opportunity to get close enough to fire at him, lest it wake up and retreat, or worse, charge the group. Deciding Mozart might make too much noise, the colonel proceeded on foot. Two guides armed with spears led the way, tracking the elephant. Naylor was behind Bloomfield, and behind them were two other locals, carrying extra rifles. A local police officer also joined, and then, further back, was the female elephant with a rider on top. He hoped the big animal was far enough back as to not make too much noise. It was a risk, but one he was willing to take as he thought the female might be able to distract the bull if things went horribly wrong. Before they went, the colonel gave them all one very specific instruction. Don't say a word. 
The guides soon picked up on the trail of the killer elephant and it led them back into the bamboo forest. The brush was so thick over top that the early morning sun couldn't penetrate and they crept forward in relative darkness. They followed the instruction of no talking and only communicated with hand gestures until, after a time, a guide exhaled and froze just before a grassy clearing and whispered, It's him. Bloomfield and Naylor moved to the front and moved towards the tall grass. The colonel was right. The big bull was lying in the grass in front of them, sleeping. The animal was sleeping with its back turned to the men. They knew they would need a better angle for the first shot. The tough hide of the elephant meant that the first shot would have to count. Bloomfield crept as quietly as he could, trying to circle around to get a better shot on the animal. Focusing on the elephant, he stood on a patch of dried leaves, and the rustle was enough to disturb the giant as its ear twitched and perked up. Now or never, he fired, and a moment later, Naylor did the same, aiming for the head region of the animal. The bull stood up and started to run off into the jungle. The group pursued, not wanting the elephant to get a chance to escape or to turn around and charge the men. Whenever the elephant slowed down to rest or to gather its bearings, the men caught up and hit it with another volley, and the process went on and on until the elephant came to a river and forced its way to the other side. There it tried to turn, but as it did, Bloomfield and Naylor and the others fired yet again at the injured animal. The bull let out a final trumpeting yell and dropped onto the muddy bank. The killer of Mandala had been killed. When the female heard the yell of pain, she turned and ran. The guides tried to thrust their spears into the dead bull's head, but his hide was too thick. Bloomfield noted that even lying down, the elephant was so large that two men who stood on opposite side of the body would not be able to see each other over the mass of the huge creature. Parts of the animal were removed and partially eaten, and that's where the bull's story ends. But how did it begin? How did this large elephant end up in a region of India that didn't have wild elephants? And why did it have such a hatred of people? Well, it's hard to get cold hard facts, but it seems generally agreed that the elephant must have been owned by someone and that it had obviously escaped its ownership. The book Wild Beasts even said that it killed its master before doing so. When the elephant made its way out into the jungle, there were no other elephants around to join with. Bloomfield wrote that there were accounts of the animal befriending a pair of water buffalo, but otherwise it was alone. What happened to the bull while he was captive, we will never know, but taming an elephant can be pretty brutal, and he may have also seen fellow elephants going through the same ordeal during his captive days. Elephants are a highly social, intelligent animal, and witnessing atrocities to their fellow elephants can drive them mad. If you recall that group of male elephants that were in South Africa that seemed to go mad and started attacking other animals without reason, well, they were survivors of a culling, or to put it another way, they had been selected to be spared and then had to watch the rest of their herd be killed in front of them. It's very well documented how social elephants are and an event like this messes with the animal's psyche and many researchers believe the aggressive males had a form of PTSD. I would imagine this bull must have went through some form of continued cruelty to develop such an intense hatred for humans. Though content at first to simply stay away from humans, once it went into must and its hormones rose and the memories of the cruelty returned, the elephant wanted to almost enact revenge on the creatures that had abused it. Or at least, that's my best guess as to why the elephant was the way it was. Regardless, in the jungle, even giants face consequences and the cruelty that made it a terror also sealed its fate.